Now, if you look up in the top left corner, our, especially for our new friends, you'll see um, our beloved spiritual home, uh, which is uh, Shars Landing, a fabulous venue and, um, what do you call it? Anyway, wonderful place to stay mm -hmm. and to do stuff. Uh, it's it's uh, up on, a, on Argyle Hill in Port Alberni over sort of the grand view from a distance um, of the, the beautiful Alberni waterfront and, uh, and Charlene Patterson who manages our Zoom production is uh, the... Is creeping in. There she is. Yeah, I get a great view. If you go look down her street, Argo, you'll get a view of the ocean. Yeah. And the best balcony to a patio to sit on. I sat there last night and had oh, supper. And oh. I love sitting on her patio when I'm, when I'm back at my house. Wonder. The Wonder. best patio ever. And looming in the background, there is our mascot, Luma, hanging up in the rafters, the golden mermaid, the electric mermaid. Yeah, she's a work of work of fine sculpture yeah. that, that hangs there and, uh, yeah, has become our, our mascot for the, the electric mermaid. Yeah, she is an actual lan lantern that is handcrafted by a number of artisans, all contributing little scales and 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 big bones to get her uh illuminated she was recently restored which is very once once we um called this the electric mermaid it, it was time for restoration and the creators stepped in and did a beautiful job so when this is all over <laughs> when when the pandemic is all over uh we'll be returning i'm sure to shars landing and and uh, looking to welcome people in person when you're coming through. You plan your visits to come to Shars too. Yeah, we look forward to the day. We can uh, all get together there, eh? Yeah. Boy, it's been a long time. Has been too. There we go. Yeah. And every time we start to get a little glimmer of hope, then the numbers start going up again. <laughs> we start going, oh, So just no. those young guys, the young 29 to 30, 39, they gotta yeah. behave. Yeah. Well, you know what they're doing? They're doing a, a, a wonderful job of keeping things running. So we're very grateful yeah. for the millennial yes. touch. That's no, no, yeah, no. And some of them are working. So I'm not saying they're all bad. Just some of them are. Oh my gosh. <laughs> of course. But then there's some older people too. So I don't know. There could be some older ones out there, the two that are being mad, bad. It's very difficult for some people. That's for sure. Oh, mm -hmm. it is. And when the weather gets nice, it makes it harder, right? Because everybody wants to, oh, that's nice. I'm okay. I can go out and do this. Mm -hmm. No. So it looks like it's time. I want to welcome <coughs> everyone. It's one minute to the hour. I'm just going to mute everyone. Oh. And uh, I mean, except for our hosts. And uh, I'm Shar, Shar's Landing, Port Alberni, beautiful Vancouver Island. And we welcome everyone. We welcome our features and we thank everyone. And I'm going, going to hand over to Carl to introduce Derek. I have to, oh my gosh, I was supposed to say it was, I forgot what I was going to say. I usually have something. But Derek has been in Port Alberni for a long time. He's been part of Forest Fest and worked at the North Island College. Take it away, Derek. I told him my, my, see, being out too much. Sorry, I was muted, wasn't I? Was that okay? That was fine. Thank you, Carl. I'm unmuted now. It's all good. So welcome, everyone. Uh, really glad to to uh, have everybody joining us here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a once a month event, and I look for do it so much. Uh, we get a chance to share some wonderful reading and listen to each other and connect a little bit and feel like we're not quite so alone in this pandemic. It's, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, really excited tonight with the two featured readers that we have, uh, Michelle and Francine. Uh, uh, you know, reading over the, the bio information, I'm just chomping at the bit to hear what you have to read. And uh, really excited about that. So uh, just want to say a few shout outs before we get going. First of all, a big shout out and thank you to the Hepetchaseth and Seashat First Nations people. Uh, we're on their unceded territory here in Port Alberni and every day we're grateful that they share our land, uh, their land with us. 
and um, that we can be here together. And of course, big shout out to Shar for, for being our Zoom host and uh, making this whole thing work. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Shar. And, uh, and a reminder that uh, if you're uh, able to send some donation her way to keep her, her venue running, that would be fantastic. Uh, it's just e-transfer at sharslanding.com. Very easy and uh, she's very grateful to have any support she can get at this time. Uh, not being able to have the face-to-face -face venues that she normally does. So uh, please, please do go ahead and donate if you are at all able. Um, and thank you to Jackie Carmichael for lining everybody up tonight, our, our featured readers. She does an incredible job as our artistic director, uh, getting a hold of people and lining them up. And thank you to Carl for being the moderator, as always, my, my faithful assistant who keeps everything running smoothly, keeps me on the straight and narrow. And uh, thank you also to, uh, to Micah Gardner. I don't think he's with us tonight, but he's our, our photographer for the Electric Mermaid. Always appreciated and always insightful. Appreciate his, uh, his input into the, the organization. So we are uh, just a, an ad hoc community organization and uh, we come together for Electric Mermaid as a, a place to, to share uh, writing and um, create literary community online. Uh, we welcome diversity and um, free speech, providing it doesn't stray into the neighborhood of hate speech or, you know, deep criticisms that are not helping anybody without any uh, conversation around it. So, um, but we haven't had any issues that way, but we do want to just remind people that that's, that's a big part of who we are. We're here to, to create community, not to divide community. So, and um, just hang on a second. Oh, there we go. Okay. The television has been muted in the other room. <laughs> the beauties of Zoom. So, um, yeah, welcome everybody. And uh, we're going to start off with a, a couple of our, uh, our, just our open mic or our Luma's List readers. And then we're going to go into our, our featured readers after that. And, and we'll have some time for questions and answers. And of course, reminding everybody, there's a chat box on the side if you have anything you're wanting to share with everybody. Uh, because you're muted, it's kind of hard to do. So just throw it into the chat box and people can, uh, can access it there. And you can actually save the chat at the end of the night if there's uh, websites or whatever. If you've got books you're, <clears throat> you're wanting to, um, to promote and market, then maybe throw it in the chat in terms of where those books are available. And uh, all's good. So uh, we're going to start off tonight with Kamal Parr, and she comes to us from Nanaimo. And I should mention that Kamal is going to be doing a, a featured reading for us uh, uh, through Char. It's not actually not through Electric Mermaid, but Char is, is hosting it on Zoom, and I'm going to um, MC that one for her. And that one's coming up on Sunday, the, the 25th of April at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So please mark that one on your calendar and um, Jackie will get you to throw that into the chat just so people can access it there if they need to. And um, we're really looking forward to, to uh, her poetry reading. She's got three books of poetry out and, and uh, so she's gonna share with us uh, some things from all three of those books, I understand. So, so welcome tonight, Kamal, and please uh, take it away and, and uh, let's hear what you have to share with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Derek. And uh, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, um, thank you, everyone, especially the organizers, Shar and um, Derek and Carl and multi talented Jacqueline. This lovely Port Alberni. I always love that place, been there a number of times. And uh, I especially like the view of the ocean. And there's a store, uh, e tree there, fish and chips. I love that. Anyway, coming down to my poems, I want to share uh, two, three poems from my first book, uh, Fleeting Shadows. This was um, my first poem, my poetry book, when we just came to the prairies and, you know, from my original country, India, to have landed into the frigid sort of winter, which is not prepared for it at all, but I just fell in love with the prairies. And uh, so I wrote a couple of poems out there. So my first poem, which I would like to read, is Driving Down a Prairie Highway. I have a long way to go, the highway a straight line, 
barren stretches of heaving grasslands pockmarked with straggly scrub and bush. I feel alone. The silence cold. Keep my hand on the steering wheel. Listen to the steady hum of the engine and try to focus on the black thread of the highway that curves and dips and finally makes U-turn around the hills wrapped in heavy mist. Outside, it's minus 20 degrees. I adjust the heater and turn on the radio. Soft music crackles in the air. Someone croons a 70s song. Keeps me from falling asleep. I put the cavalier on cruise. Feel relieved, but heavy-eyed. The dusky dome of sky slowly turns a silver gray. It's almost twilight on the eastern horizon. Faint lights flicker in a few homesteads, neatly tucked away behind naked willows and bald hills. In the distant east, the winter sky changes color, from scarlet to a muted gray. Shades of darkness close in. Thank you. That's why uh, Saskatchewan is called the land of the living skies, and that's something which really um, left a very strong indelible mark on me. So let's come here now. So this is a poem about a, a contrast between the beautiful, I mean, that's also pretty, the Paredes and this lovely, again, you know, Vancouver Island. The ocean view in spring. I look up through the tinted glass pane of my window, the rugged line of the misty mountains faintly visible, sweeping lines of stratus, stratus clouds hang above as the last rays of the setting sun melt into calm waters of the ocean. Sea gulls fly low, a hollow cry carried by a gust of moisture laden ocean breeze. That makes the surf beat harder. The beach, a lonely stretch of rack, rock and sand. A crow with a broken wing hops on fallen and scarred wooden logs strewn across the lonely beach. No one knows when and for how long. Sculpted by the water, wind and the rain. A bald eagle sitting on a rocky ledge takes off. A speck frozen in memory. Before me lies the vast stretch of water, now so still, leading nowhere. A few seashells lie half buried in the wet sand. The horizon looks gray and fuzzy. Only the faint, rugged outline of the aspen-covered island is visible. Those white blobs that bob up and down are huge sailboats looking like toys, and the ocean a vast playground. I look up, breathe in the cool air, and spot a nest hanging precariously between two bare limbs of the pine tree. A motley collection of twigs and dried leaves meets the eye. A thin veil of darkness descends as the hazy outline of a huge bird settles into its nest, ruffles its feathers, and there is silence. I know it's twilight. Thank you. I'd like to read one or two haiku poems if I have the time. Um, yes, we, you ha asked for 10 minutes and so you've got another five. Please continue. Thank you. So um, a haiku, as you know, is the shortest uh, poem and you know you've got to sort of, the two lines are flow into one another. The last line is kind of, it just is a contrast. So. Hillsides turn brown, fall approaches, I return home. Hills nobbled with hay, a breath of spring, faint strumming of a guitar. Whisper of spring breeze, dandelions gently sway, fleeting time. Grey chasm of the evening, fills with wobbler cries. The silent fawn. Still air, so suffocating, hangs heavy, floating lily near the shore. The iris in the narrow vase droops low, 
shafts of fading sunlight. The gray of the looming cliffs, seagulls sweep low, little boy on the deck. Lengthening shadows of willows stalk the meadow. A lone sparrow hops. Fading sun casts fleeting shadows. Each brick tells a story. And there lies the ocean, so deep and gray, a bobbing yacht. Autumn wind ruffles my hair. Fallen petals float on still waters. Fall came in gently, a splash of golden yellow, left over pumpkin pie. Standing in the shadow of time, I shed a tear or two. The sun dappled meadow. Dewdrops sit on a freshly curled petal. I glimpse the sky. White horses dot leaf flecked meadows, cool wind in the hair. Snow drizzled on the mountains, baked golden, piercing sun rays. And the last one is moonlight spills into soft waters. A lotus floats sitting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamal. That was Thank that you. was lovely, lovely. Thank you. I especially appreciated the the faint strumming of the guitar for spring. <laughs> That's a, that kind of sums it up, doesn't it? It's just the music is coming back to the world, and yes, yeah, we're hungry yeah. for it. Yeah, I hope so. It's coming soon with the COVID going away. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your kind words. Thank you so much. All right, uh, we're going to move along then to our next uh, reader, and uh, Kathleen Vance, I believe, is probably going to share another wacky story with us. I'm hoping, and uh, and then um, we'll probably hit our featured reader right after Kathleen and and uh, our both featured readers actually, and then we'll go to David afterwards. Actually, so, Derek, it's Shar here. We we bumped you up in the list today. We were hoping you were going to read second. Oh, oh, oh dear. okay. It, uh, did we catch you off guard? Yeah, not while I got my poems right here. I can do that. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw that on the list, but I, I saw the zeros with my name, and I thought, oh, I'm, I'm really going to be at the end again as usual. But okay, no problem. I'm happy to do that. So um, I've got a couple poems to read that I've been working on lately, and I'm going to throw my glasses on so I don't misread anything. The other day, my wife uh, was was doing something to do with her, her work. She's an acupuncturist, and she she had the word sequela uh, on the page. And I looked at, I said, sequela, what is that? And she said, you don't know what sequela is. I, she says, you know, that that's all the kind of the lingering um, symptoms that people get after they've had a disease or an illness, you know. And I said, wow, it's such a beautiful word for such a horrible thing. <clears throat> but I, but uh, it's poetic. It's got to go in a poem somewhere. So I started thinking about, it and it just came, love sequela. You know that that when when we um, lose a love, how there are these lingering symptoms that that stay with us for a long time. And this happened a cross section with me getting on this Twitter feed of all these people who. Um, who had lost people during the pandemic and, and were, were really struggling uh, to, to grieve because they didn't have the typical funeral or anything to do it with. And so many of them were, were sharing this, the same sort of thoughts about how with that kind of grief, when you lose someone you love, how you, you just almost are pissed off that the rest of the world is, is going ahead like normal. And, uh, you know, it just seems like you ex almost feel like the whole world should stop. But anyway, it all came together in this poem. So love sequela. Long haul lovers know the jagged terrain of love sequela. The scatter of empty glasses, a bagel toasted twice or more still stuck in the toaster. The audacity of traffic when the world is this fractured. Such a long net we trail behind us when they leave, sticky as spider silk with all the moments stuck there her face ghosted against the shadow on the scan they called a cyst back then. The doctor asking, how would you rate your pain on a scale of one to 10? 
as she looked away across the parking lot searching for the family van. We can keep her comfortable, they said, and I say that should be the goal of Love Sequela, a fallout of comfort, something you can still feel in your fingers like a friendly tremor, reminding you of that distant past long before the, latch, the unlatching. Not the vertigo you knew in your first encounter of so much space, the world without her in it. And then the second one is uh, based on a, a story told to me by one of my hospice clients a few years back. Um, so I'll, I'll dedicate this one to Vic. It's called A Second Chance. And then I met her, Vic says. I think it was a Tuesday, the summer I drove the leaky honey truck for old man Baxter, sucking septic tanks dry for a hundred bucks a pop, of which I saw 20 in the truck and Baxter hoovered up the rest. And a day that tank always pissed a line of black water like it was when Highway Patrol waved me over just upwind of the bus with Shania Twain painted all sparkly on the side. Don't get me wrong, I always loved my wife, but something about Shania strummed that chord in my belly. Always thought I could die happy if I could just meet her once in the skin. Maybe she'd sing a chorus from Don't Be Stupid, You Know I Love You. Or that moment and no one needs to know when she says, I got my heart set, my feet wet, and he don't even know it yet, but no one needs to know right now. So there I am, standing in that honey stink, sweet talk in the cop and half hoping she'll step out of her bus and half praying she won't when the door swings open and down she comes in a pair of tight jeans and a white blouse with the bottom tails tied in a knot. She looks ready to step into the knee-high clover in the ditch when she stops. When her eyebrows dip into a steep V, she tilts her head sideways and takes us in, me sweating in my dirty coveralls, the cop's mouth inviting flies, then her finger springs up flat under her nose and she turns and hops back on the bus. At Baxter's office, I wrote, I quit on the ticket and left it on his desk. But I still listen to Shania. Some nights when I'm chemo sick and can't sleep, I play, I'm holding on to love to save my life. And I can see her white blouse waving like a flag on a stick on the other side, like I got a second chance to climb aboard her bus and drive on out of this life a happy man. Thank you, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Carl, I better consult with you then. Are we going to the featured readers now or? Yes, we're gonna to go to Michelle right now. Very good, all right, Michelle, all the way over in St. John's, Newfoundland. So let me tell everybody a little bit about Michelle before we get to, uh, to listen to her reading. So uh, Michelle Butler Hallett from St. John's, uh, author of the novels Constant Nobody and This Marlowe Deluded Your Sailors, Sky Waves and Double Blind, and the story collection The Shadow Side of Grace. And her short stories are widely anthologized. Uh, the Vagrant Review of New Fiction, Hard Old Spot, Running the Whales Back, Everything is So Political, and Best American Mystery Stories 2014. So. Um, as uh, Jacqueline Carmichael quoted or said about her, Butler Hallett's wonderful writing has been widely recognized and we are so glad she'll be on the Electric Mermaid stage at Shards Landing via Zoom. Well, I can't tell you how delighted I am to have you here, Michelle. Um, always, always glad to hear from anyone in that part of the world. I, I haven't been to St. John's for a few years, but I love the island, the rock, and, uh, and the people are very special. So welcome to Electric Mermaid. The floor is all yours. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm reading tonight from Constant Nobody, which is my new novel. Um, it is published by Gooseland Editions. We are in Moscow at this point. It is the uh, 10th of June, 1937. So this is Stalinist uh, USSR. Uh, 1937 is the year of the Great Purge. Uh, Temerity is a polyglot British secret intelligence service agent. Kostya is a polyglot officer and agent of NKVD, which is the Soviet secret police. Now, Kostya and Temerity met a few months before in northern Spain, where Kostya was expected to execute Temerity. 
uh, he didn't. They've met again in Moscow, and this time Kostya has removed Temerity from a dangerous situation and hid her in his flat. Now, given that Kostya and Temerity are political enemies, uh, Kostya's decision here is um, problematic. Uh, we've got the Great Purge on the go, which means anyone might be arrested at any time. Uh, NKVD prefer to carry out the raids in the middle of the night. Moscow has a housing shortage, and Kostya is by special arrangement of a surrogate father, NKVD officer Major Arkady Balakarev. He share, uh, sh Kostya sharing a large flat with only one other person, and that's a doctor named Yefim Sherba. Arkady compels Yefim to do many things against his conscience and better judgment, and one of them is to secretly treat Kostya's serious injuries from Spain with morphine so Kostya can keep working. Yefim is very suspicious of this woman that Kostya has brought to the flat, but does not want to know anything about her. Both Yefim and Kostya call Temerity Nadezhda, or Nadia for short. Now, the night, about five nights before, when Kostya brought Temerity to his flat, they were both impaired, Kostya by morphine and alcohol, and Temerity by a forced injection. They sneaked past a sleeping watchwoman, a woman called Yelena T... T Tihonovna Petrovna. Temerity stumbled in the lobby and somewhere between the lobby and the flat on the sixth floor, she lost her shoes. Neither Kostya nor Temerity have any idea what happened to the shoes. Uncertain what woke him, Kostya checked his watch. 17 minutes after two in the morning. Five bangs of a fist. Comrade, open the door. Kostya felt the floor beneath his feet before he understood he'd gotten out of bed. Yefim in the room next door cried out in fright. In the front room, the chair scraped against the floor as Temerity stood up. Kostya grabbed his keys and identification wallet from the side table and his robe from the closet. In the hallway, he discovered that he'd taken a uniform tunic instead. Five more bangs. Open the door, comrade! Yes, yes, I'm coming! Kostya hauled the tunic over his head, blinding himself to the sight of temerity standing behind the chair. He lurched to the door and pressed his ear to the hinge to listen. He thought he recognized the voice. Comrade Yaroslav, at once, please. We've no wish to wake your neighbors. A second man spoke. Katelnikov, listen to me. We're on the wrong floor. That's the wrong flat. They're all numbered the same in this building. Oh, fuck. No, you'll be fucked, Katelnikov, if we don't make quota. Kostya unlocked the door and stepped into the dirty light of the one hanging bulb. Katelnikov? Matvey Katelnikov whirled around, faced the man who has called his name, his commanding officer. I, oh no. Nodding to Matvey and then to his partner, Kostya showed his ID. Can I be of any help? A third officer ascended the stairs, his voice stiff with embarrassment. Nikto, is that you? Kostya recognized the third officer, an older sergeant, one of his department colleagues, not that he could remember his name. So many new men. Ah, Dobrynin, right. Good morning, Dobrynin. Dobrynin squinted at Kostya's tunic and undershorts. Light sleeper, Nikto? When fellow officers beat on my door, yes. Matvey gave a little cry. Then he cleared his throat. The numbers on the doors are um, all the same on each floor. We're on the wrong floor. An accident, Comrade Sergeant Dobrynin. A simple oversight. A simple idiot? Who's on your list, Katelnikov? Uh, Yaroslav, Nikolai Edwardovich, fifth floor, flat number seven. Then go directly below to the fifth floor, flat number seven, and arrest Yaroslav. 
Yes, Comrade Sergeant. Dobrynin turned on the second officer. And you! Find the other one, what? Uh, Petrovna, Yelena Tikhonova. Comrade Senior Lieutenant Nikto, permit me to show you the list. Now, which flat is Petrovna's? Kostya felt dizzy. This floor, flat number two, down the hall. She's very old. I have no idea how she manages the stairs. There, you see? Comrade Senior Lieutenant Nikto can read the list just fine, and we just woke him up out of a sound sleep. So the problem is not with the list. As the second officer found Yelena's flat and beat on the door, Dobrynin offered Kostya a cigarette and matches. Kostya lit the cigarette and took a deep drag. Puppies. Dobrynin nodded. Once we're back at Lubyanka, I'll kick them up the arse. Mm. Telephone directories, Dobrynin. In flower sacks, yes? Leaves no marks, so the, uh, the boys will look fit for duty. They both chuckled and wished each other a good night. As Kostya retreated into the flat and locked the door, the arresting officer called Yelena's name. Yefim and Temerity stood near the kitchen at the end of the corridor to the door. Temerity in Kostya's pajamas and clutching a book to her chest, Yefim fully dressed and carrying a small suitcase. Yefim whispered, Are they gone? Kostya's laugh, quick and rough, sounded more like the yelp of a dog. Not yet! Down the hall, Yelena screeched her protest, her loyalty to the party. I can prove it, comrade! These shoes! Temerity dropped the book. Kostya and Yefim flinched but kept quiet. Matve ran back up the stairs. Do you need help, Comrade Sergeant Dobrynin? Dobrynin sounded amused. Shoes, Grandmother? The witch who lost these shoes cringes here. I saw her. Senile old sow. Matvey disagreed. Uh, with respect, Comrade Sergeant, take a look at these shoes. This lettering inside them. I think that's English. Kostya stared at Temerity. He couldn't speak. Yefim saw this and shut his eyes. Dobrynin's voice approached the door. Nikto knows languages. I'll get him. Cigarette gone to ash. Kostya waved Tem Temerity and Yefim away, pointing to the bedrooms. They kept still. Matvey almost shouted, No, no, please don't disturb Comrade Senior Lieutenant Nikto again. Oh, you timid little rabbit, Katelnikov. What, are you in love with him? Don't want to upset his beauty sleep? No, wait, Yelena's voice rang out. Yosef Vissarionovich! Temerity stepped close enough to Kostya to whisper, she calls on Stalin? Kostya nodded. Yosef Asarinovich, help me, help me, I am loyal to you. Yosef Asarinovich, hear my prayer. Yosef. A heavy thud. Dobrynin laughed. Pistol whipping old ladies, Katelnikov. Nobody's rabbit now. Get her in the car. Men grunted, feet dragged. After some noisy difficulty on the stairs, Kostya guessing that they allowed the unconscious woman to roll, Dobrynin returned to the fifth floor to collect Yaroslav. The NKVD car departed. Yefim felt much of the tension leave his body. Yet even this relief corroded him, scarring his thoughts and feelings as much as shrapnel had scarred Kostya's shoulder. Not me. 
Not me. Not me. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was awesome. So we're going to open it up for a few questions and answers here if, uh, if you're up for that. And yes, please. Uh, I'll uh, maybe just start it off. I'm just curious. I mean, I, kudos to your imagination to be able to enter uh, Russian soldiers like that and, and capture them in, in a very believable way. I mean, I was, I was transported there. Um, how did you manage that? Did you do a bunch of research or? Yes. Um, I've been interested in Russian literature and history and culture for a very long time. I, I studied a, a fair bit when I was an undergraduate at university. Um, researching and writing this novel took me about five years. I have a full-time day job as well. Um, came across a couple, of, a, a, a couple of really, really helpful books, but it was a long, slow process. I can imagine, for sure. Uh, Jackie, did you have a question there? Oh, I sure do. Uh -oh. I, I I love this so much. The uh, uh, the Soviet getting into the Soviet thing. Do you have any writers like? I mean, I think of like uh, uh, Carré or uh, uh, the the guy who wrote Gorky Park. I, some of the the ones that I, I think of in set in in Cold War. Um, Eastern Europe. Uh, do you have any, any writers in particular that kind of maybe influenced you? Uh, a, lot, a lot of Soviet writers, which of course I've had to read in translation, um, right from Yevgeny Zamyatin all the way up to um, a little bit of Pasternak. I haven't finished any Pasternak. Um, Mikhail Bulgakov, uh, John Le Carre for sure in English. I love the way Le Carre's um, shows his characters through frames of deceit and the squalor of espionage work. I really do like that. Um, also, a, a current Russian writer named, um, oh my goodness, he wrote Day of the Opreknik. Vladimir, I'll, I'd have to look it up, I'm sorry. I, sh I should have that, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> um, the guy who wrote Gorky Park, I think, uh, Martin Cruz. I've read several of his novels, I, I, I really enjoy them. Fantastic. Beautiful. Wow, you did a wonderful job to me, to me. That made it very vivid. And sometimes, I don't know, like War and Peace will freeze you out with all the long names and all the, you know, the extractions and stuff. But, but fabulous job of, of making it just like a contemporary. Um, is, now, is it set in current day? Is it set? 1937. Oh, gosh, 1937. I knew that, right? Because we were talking about Stalin. Okay. All right. What, The Purge? That's what you call it? Yeah, The Purge. Great Purge, yep. Great mm. Purge. Ah, oh, fantastic. Beautiful work. Thank you. Right. Anyone else out there in Zoom land want to uh, ask Michelle anything? Now would be a good time. Uh, no, I'm not hearing anyone. Come oh, forward. No, I have a question. Oh, there we go. Go ahead. Is that Francine? Kathy. Oh, Kathy. Oh. Unmute yourself, Kathy. I'm mute. Sorry. Um, say something about your interest in the Great Purge, because I think you really captured, even in that little bit you read, it was so extraordinary, the way you captured something. And I think you must be, you know, what, what is your particular interest in a Great Purge? And you see any relevance for us? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's it's an abuse of power, of course, and that's and that's that's a constant concern, no matter what political system you're you're living under. One of the things that strikes me about the Great Purge that is uh, certainly a warning for us now is that if you dehumanize another person through racism, sexism, colonialism, or any other kind of tyranny, then um, once we've dehumanized another person, we can do anything to them and find a way to justify it. And I I, I think that that's a constant of the human condition. Um, I'm thinking about the situation in, in Ontario, excuse me, Ontario, there we go, right now with the, uh, with the pandemic. And one of my worst nightmares since this started is threatening to play out there where, the doc where doctors are going to have to just start doing battlefield triage and thinking, okay, who, who, who lives, who dies, basically. That's what, that's what they're hoping to avoid. So, so anybody's internal biases under that kind of stress are going to come into play. So if you're looking at two patients, one of whom is, uh, say, quite clearly physically disabled like I am, 
and somebody who seems to be quite robust and healthy, am I going to be assumed to be not worthy of the ventilator because somebody perceives me as being less human than the other person? You know, this, this, it's um, one of the huge lessons of the Great Purge is I think the, the very, very urgent ethical necessity to recognize the equality of all human beings. That's great. Bruce, you've got a question there. Yeah, I'm a student of the uh, Second World War, so mm -hmm. the Purge, uh, Stalin's Purge. Uh, he took out so many of his high-trained uh, uh, military people. Like oh, Chukachevsky especially, yes. A swack of them. And yep. uh, then they walk into World War II, and he wonders, Stalin wonders why he gets defeated all over the place. He's got... <laughs> people that uh, are terrified of Stalin for one thing, but they also don't technically know what they're doing for the mm -hmm. first couple of years. And you wonder, Trump, mm -hmm. what in the hell he was doing for a couple of years is terrified and got rid of, mind you, they fired him or, or they quit or whatever, mm -hmm. is people that knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. This to me is an example of uh, of, of that kind of a purge, getting rid of your supporters or the people that really know what they're doing because you think you got a better idea. Anyway, uh, Stalin had a hell of a time for the, for quite a while. Uh, he did, and when the, and when when uh, when Nazi Germany turned on him, uh, the story goes he went into retreat in his dacha for three days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's even a version of that story where where he confessed to a priest and realized. Yeah. I've screwed over my country. He was afraid of his officers because he was afraid of a coup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but all of a sudden, he has to he, he has to defend his country. And the, of course, the, one of the things the Soviets ended up doing was fighting a war of attrition. They yeah. just had so many people. That's a huge tragedy. Yeah. And uh, well, that's what also, they had to pay pay for yeah. the, the guys. Uh, Absolutely, met the fifty million people. Yeah. And and Soviet citizens and soldiers alike were informed that if they were if they were were captured as POWs, it would be a considerable disgrace, and their families would be punished. That's why so many of them fought to the death. Yep, yep, yep. Oof. I uh, like I say, I've studied that war for fifty years now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, the purge was uh, you captured it pretty good there. I actually thought maybe that the gun was going to come out with the old lady and boom, because that's the way to get rid of nonsensical people mm -hmm. very easily and nobody give a hoot. Anyway, sorry. Good job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Nice, lively discussion. <laughs> we covered a lot of ground. Okay. Anyone else have a last question here before we move along? No, we're good. Okay. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was, uh, that was really a, a, an enjoyable read and, and a lively discussion. And uh, I think you put in the chat where your, your book's available there, right? Eh? Yes, I have. So I just direct everybody to have a look there. And um, I just have to remind um, people something that I forgot to remind us all about at the beginning is that this gets recorded and goes on on YouTube. Uh, Shar posted up on YouTube and occasionally takes some still shots along the way. So uh, I should have warned you all about that beforehand. You know, if it's too late, you've embarrassed yourself. I'm sorry, but uh, it's all good. Um, so thanks for that. Okay, our uh, our next featured reader then is uh, is Francine Maristi, and I want to tell you a little bit about her. And she's coming to us from uh, Saskatoon tonight in beautiful Big Sky Country, Saskatchewan. Uh, Kamala mentioned that earlier about the skies out there, and I uh, I must say I lived in the prairies for three years, and that's one thing I I still miss now and then those huge skies. My. All right, so let's get on the right page here. <laughs> that help. All right, so um, Francine is the author of Escotu Escu, and I'm going to let you cor correct that pronunciation when you come on Poetry of a Northern Res Girl. So she's a Nahitwa, Nahita Escu, and I'm, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the, the reserve. Please forgive me, but uh, I'll let you do that. And in, in your northern, that's from in northern Saskatchewan. And so you're a member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation and a fluent Cree speaker. And uh, graduated from high school, went to university, got a BA in psychology, and then ended up working oh. for the, uh, the um, government with the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls 
uh, inquiry as a statement taker. And that, as I understand, turned you to poetry as, a, as an outlet to try and process some of that, that pain that you had to digest, uh, having listened to those stories for, for as long as you did. And uh, I, I know how poetry can be an outlet from, for that pain uh, of missing people, having written a book about that myself. Uh, so um, uh, Francine is a three generation survivor of Canada's residential school system. Her grandmother and her father were also taken into the residential school system. Uh, as a child, Francine uh, spoke Cree exclusively and noticed that her grandmother, now 93, was smart and funny and likable, but had difficulty showing affection. So no doubt uh, due to the residential school experience. So her parents had 11 children, so their three bedroom home, home was overcrowded. And in the 1980s, she was sent to Prince Albert Indian Residential School where she attended for grades three and four and uh, had the joyful experience of, of one of Canada's residential schools which I'm sure has informed your life and, and uh, informs your, your work and your writing as well. So I'm uh, really delighted to welcome you here tonight, Francine, and, and so looking forward to hearing some of your poetry. And um, I see that we've got on the chat that you can, uh, your books are available on amazon.ca. If there's anywhere else that you'd prefer people to get them, then just please uh, go ahead and let us know. So, uh, the Zoom screen is all yours, Francie. Please uh, make yourself at home here. All right, hello everybody. I'm here in Saskatoon and um, I'm going to, first I'm gonna do a, a, a land acknowledgement. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that Saskatoon here is on Treaty 6 territory. And all the people here are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Can you hear me well? Am yes. I coming in clear? Okay. Yeah. Treaty six encompasses the traditional territories of numerous First Nations, including Cree, Dene, Nakoda, Soto, and Ojibwe, and is also the homeland of the Métis Nation. I am dedicated to ensuring that the spirit of reconciliation and Treaty 6 is honored and respected. This acknowledgement also reaffirms our relationship with one another. So meaning First Nations people and uh, non-First Nations people. All right, and here's the cover of my book. It hasn't, it's gonna be coming out in May. So I only, Francine, excuse me, is Shar Zoom producer here. And may I invite you, I know you have uh, two devices. Could you look down into the camera so yep. we can see you. Do, you? do you see us? Okay, well. You see um, Derek? There you go. Bless your heart. We got there, it now. There's, there's actually two. Like I can see, I'm on I two know, of them. but the one that you see right now is the one we, we want to see your smile. So thank okay, you. Okay. Please continue. I'm sorry to interrupt. All right. So, um, yeah, so my book will become available in May. And because I only have a limited time, I'm just going to read my poetry, which is. Um, gonna be in that book, Iskutiu Isquil, right? So first I'm gonna read a poem called Since Time Immemorial. And this is how I met um, Jackie when I posted this, cause this, this, um, this piece actually is gonna be published in the Best American Poetry 2021. And that's coming out in September. So this one is since time immemorial. I've heard these words spoken repeatedly as a child. The story of my indigenous history shared with audience after audience, burnt into my memory. We have been here since time immemorial. It means a time so long ago, people have no knowledge of it. How long has your family lived in Saskatchewan? My law school application asks. I pause for a moment, then write, 
since time immemorial. Before Saskatchewan was, we were. So this one is um, called Moccasin Dreams. And there's a Cree word in here. It's Nukum. And Nukum means my grandmother. So this is Moccasin Dreams. Nukum dreams of times long ago, watching her grandma scrape moose hair in the shade, pines overhead, sun heavy, mosquitoes biting, sweat sliding down high cheekbones, or cutting out patterns slowly for moccasins, leather soft between fingers, beating brightly colored flowers, green stemmed, rabbit trimmed. Nukum walks in a dimly lit cabin, wind whistling, candle wax dripping slowly, moccasins on the floor, burrows in a blanket, fire dying, eyelids closing. Nugum gets up, boils water for early morning tea, pots and pans banging, retrieving her silver bowl, baking bannock on her Kenmore stove, catches the city bus to town, shopping at co-op, gingerbread cookies for her granddaughter. A quick, a quick drink at the bar, Ryan Coke. Back at home, moccasins on, passed down through generations, soft leather, bright colored flowers, enjoying gingerbread cookies in the backyard, sun heavy, sweat sliding down our high cheekbones. This one is called Wisagi Chak. And this one is like, Wisagi Chak is a trickster in our culture. And I heard Wisagi Chak stories growing up from my father and also from other community members. So this is, um, Wisagi Chak has um, been in our culture for, for a long time. And this is an adaption of Wisagi Chak, okay. Wisagi Chak. Wisagi Chak came to visit last night. He was in the mighty wind that blew across the prairies. He was looking for those who would keep his memory alive of the days when he played tricks on all the animals. He told me of the time he danced with the birds blindfold dance, he called it. In fact, he was getting his supper, killed a few birds before he got caught and the birds flew off. He's a trickster, you see. He still longs for those days. I listened to a few stories, then he left with the wind. He didn't tell me this one, but I heard it when I was a child. He was lost in the woods on a hot day sat on a rock and burnt his skin off, left howling, must have gotten turned around. When he came upon the rock again and saw two pieces of dried meat, he was so hungry he took them and ate them. The animals teased him saying, Wisagi chat umigi imits it. But he said, no, my grandma gave me this dried meat. I'm sure this is not the story he wants passed around. But who, for, but who could forget the day Wisagi Chak Umigi meets it? The trickster ate his own ass. And this, this one is called Precious Inheritance. And this one is the time when um, my mom was almost taken to the residential school, but her father wouldn't allow it. 
It's called Precious Inheritance. Joe, we are here for your children. They will receive the best education by God's holy men and women. Treated only with dignity and respect. They will eat the best foods, comfort and laughter will fill their days. No, that's okay, Joe says. I can take care of my own children. Now, Joe, if you don't allow your children to be educated, you will not receive your monthly check. Yeah, who cares? I don't need your check. You can shove it where the sun don't shine. All three walk away. One in a headdress, one in a black robe with a fancy cross, one in a pressed suit. From my hiding place, I emerge, a little girl of six. The significance of my father's giam escapes me for years. Language intact, traditions unbroken, culture continuous, inheritance for my children. And that's the reason why I can speak Cree. And this is my own experience at the residential school. It's a short one. It's called PA Indian Residential School Student. It was the late 80s. We were still babies, supervised by ladies, far from home, lined up like inmates, girls crying at night, souls slowly dying, kids running to get home, caught, they had to pay. Leave it in the past, get over it, they say. But shit, I got hit. Okay, then I'll quit. Just get good and lit. I'll read this one about my mother. My mother passed away um, a few years ago. And a lot of my poetry is about her. And my memory is of her. This one is called My Mother's Love. My mother was traditional in her ways. An unbroken line of love extended through her. Love born long ago, sparked by creator's hand. In the boreal forests where rivers flowed pristine and lakes glistened in the morning light. This is the love that got her up in the early mornings to cook us breakfast. The love that never wavered in the midst of wicked storms. And if you want to know this love, it flows. It can be heard in the beat of the drum. Can be seen when Kukum cooks bannock in an open fire by the lake. Can be tasted when biting into freshly cooked moose meat can be smelled in freshly picked mint, the one put in tea, can be felt in a warm embrace, never wanting to let go. This is the love that flows through us now, an unbroken line of love extending through time, sparked by creator's hand. I can read um, two more because I don't want to read all the poems in my in my book, right? <laughs> so this one is called I'm a Cree woman, but it's called in my language, I'm a Nihiao Isquil. Isquil means woman and Nihiao means Cree. With beautiful brown skin, long beautiful hair. I comb and braid with care. Brown, beautiful eyes. No, I don't believe your lies. I love me. You see, I'm Cree. I love the indigenous way of life. 
sometimes filled with strife, racism, lateral violence, discrimination. But regardless, I'm a proud member of a Cree nation. Some feel ashamed to be, but no, not me. I laugh with glee because I'm Cree. I am more than what you see. I live sovereign. Inside, I'm free. Yes, I got some academic degrees, but that's not what makes me. It's this Nihawi blood in me. I'm Cree, a Nihawi isqui. And this is um, the last one. It's called Reconciliation. So this is um, what I think about reconciliation at this point. Settler colonialism is resistant to change, stubborn, but a new vision is being created of reconciliation. I see baby steps. Hope is born in my heart, even as I experience discrimination and violence. In the future, when I'm gone, if my forgiveness is needed for all the injustices I've experienced to make this vision a reality, I give it freely. I forgive. And that's it. Wow. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much, Francine. That was that was powerful. That was moving. Very moving. So we'll open it up for questions and answers now. If anyone has any uh, questions they'd like to ask Francine. Uh, Jim, did did you have a question there? No. I know as you mentioned in the chat, you uh, you come from the same region. That's cool. Very cool. So I'll ask you, uh, Francine, um, it's beautiful, I, I, you know, especially your last poem there about forgiveness. And, um, you know, when I, when I see some of the injustices that have happened to uh, First Nations people, continue to happen to First Nations people, uh, and yet so many that I, that I know and, and, and meet still are able to forgive, and I just, uh, I just, uh, I just applaud your your big heart, and I just wonder what the process has been for you. I mean, it must not have been easy to come to that place where you're ready to offer forgiveness. Um, if it's not too personal, would you like to share a little bit about that? Well, um, I think reconciliation is like um, like it's part of the TR TRC process, right? So that's how reconciliation came up, and I think like it's it's kind of like imposed on us, right? Like it's a government mandated thing. So now it's here and this is what we're gonna do, but you know, like are people even ready? So it's a start and it's a good start, but I don't see it moving as fast as it should. And you know, I'm, I'm hoping like in the future that it's leading that way. And even though like in my poem, I said, I see baby steps, right? There, there's people out there that are, that are um, taking up the cause and are, and are really trying to, to move toward reconciliation. But I think there's still a lot, uh, um, quite a ways to go. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's not going to be an overnight thing, <laughs> but when we have so such a history and and such a an ongoing um, situation as well. I have uh, a question, but I'm not sure if I'm muted or not. Can no, you... you're you're on, Joy. Go ahead. Um, are you related to Augie Morosti at all? He was a West Coast uh, native. He wrote a wonderful book, and uh, the title escapes me. It's one of the best books I ever read. He was on the streets of Vancouver, I think, and I believe he won a major prize for writing the book. Do you know the author I'm talking about? His name yeah, was Tony that, Morasti. That's I, actually my uncle. Well, not my uncle, my grandfather. So that's my dad's uncle. 
And he was an incredible writer, just an incredible writer too. And he, he is actually, that's actually not in Vancouver. It was in Prince Albert. Oh, okay. That, that's where he was living. And for the longest time, like he, he always said he was writing a book, right? So, but he was kind of like a street person. So he said that for the past 20 years and nobody believed that he was writing a book, but apparently the book came out <laughs> and um, yeah, unfortunately he passed away not, you know, about five years ago or a few years ago, but yeah, he did write a really um, like a popular book on uh, residential schools. Was I it think he was I, I think it was called The Schooling of Augie Morosti. I or I'm sorry, I may be mispronouncing it. Augie Morosti, is that It's how called it? the, the Education the of education. Augie Morosti. Yeah. I really recommend it. It was a great book. Mm -hmm. And seemingly, Derek, you'll love this. He wrote it on bits of full scap paper and sent it to, I believe it was a professor of history at one of the colleges. He sent it to this uh, English professor in, or history in fits and starts. He'd send so many pages every few months. And eventually this man, was, this teacher was so impressed with his writing that he collated into a book and it became a major seller on the West Coast anyway, out here. It was very popular. So Francine, I, Francine, I understand that your book is going to be translated into Cree too. Is that right? Yeah. So um, the English version version is coming out in May, and then a Cree version. It's going to be translated by my father. He's translating all the English poems into Cree, and that's going to come out next year, next twenty twenty two. Yeah. So exciting! I cannot wait to read your book. I ha have it on order, and uh, and just. I love your work. That last that last poem is just amazing to me, and I found myself in the same uh, place, I guess, as as Derek, wondering where where in you it came from the, the power to say I forgive, because it's it's a very long list of you know. I mean, that it's just amazing to to come to the table with that. I think that's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other, anyone else want to pipe up? Uh, got a hand there. Michelle. Michelle go ahead. Michelle. Yes. Go uh, ahead, Michelle. Francine, just, oh, hang on. Francine, just thank you for writing that. That was, uh, that, that is beautiful work. You're welcome. Thank you. Francine, I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about what got you started. I mean, you're an attorney. You're an attorney, and you were working as a, um, a, a an account taker, like you were you were taking down the accounts that people would 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 tell you from the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry, right? Right. So, yeah. I I started working for them in 2017, and I started as a statement taker. So, what a statement taker did in that, in that uh, inquiry is we would sit with uh, the families of missing and murdered women. So I'd be sitting in a hotel room and then the, the family member, I'd be sitting across from them and I, I would be recording them like with a camera and a, and a video record, um, audio recorder. And then they would tell me the story, like it was not scripted. And uh, so I'd have like some questions so it was like anything goes like I would hear the most horrific um, things right and then I would have to be like professional so like no crying you know and I did this um, for eight months so eight months of like of these stories that were like quite quite horrific and so because it was quite a fast paced um, work, like we were always on the road, I didn't have time to, to get therapy or anything like that. And it was really affecting me. And so when I was at home, and it was a really cold winter, that winter I remember, it was the winter of 2017, 2018, really cold. So, um, 
I started writing poetry, but I didn't do it like con consciously. Like I just started writing and then I was, and then I continued writing. And then looking back, it was, for me, it was a way of healing, a way of uh, therapy. And that's, that's what it came to be. And that's how I became a writer of, of poetry, right? Like it wasn't even intentional. It just kind of happened. Yeah. And thank God it did. <laughs> we're, we're glad. We're glad. Derek, Derek, we have two more Pillow One questions there. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her name again. Adele. Adele, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, Francine, your images of, of uh, moose meat and fish and blueberries, it just brought back memory, memories so much uh, of moose hunting. But uh, I just about ordered your book, and then I realized I won it at the last Yak Fest. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited, I can hardly wait to get it. <laughs> I ordered it. Yeah. You, can always, you can always buy one for someone else, Ardell, you know. This is true. I can. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Francine. Yeah, it's beautiful. You're welcome. Thank you. And Chris. Uh, Krista's iPhone? Krista's iPhone, she had a question. Go ahead, Krista. Just unmute yourself. We can't hear you yet, Krista. Can you unmute or um, does somebody else need to do that for you? Uh, I'm not hearing. Uh, Krista, are you there? I, I've tried. It's sharp. I've tried a few times to unmute and I'm not. Oh, okay. Well, maybe okay. by the end of, maybe after yep. after the, the event, she'll be able to unmute. Um, but so thank you, Krista, for connecting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Well, could I just say thank you very, very much? It was just beautiful to listen to your <laughs> writing. It was just wonderful. Thank you so much. It's very powerful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. Yeah, thanks again, Francine. And, and um, please uh, feel free to stay with us while we have some more of our uh, uh, Luma's List reading here and, and uh, we'll maybe have some time to chat at the end if people feel like it as well. So, so uh, let's move along then. We're going to have our next reader is, uh, is Kathleen. And as far as I know, Kathleen Vance, who I had on the deck for a minute a while back and then had to punch you out of the way. I'm sorry for that, Kathy. I'm always doing something to you. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, great to have you back with uh, with another story, and and hopefully you're going to continue in that that um, wacky, uh, wacky. The, the wacky kids voice that I love so much. It it uh, it's great. All right, take it away. Okay. Anne in Mars, please come to my desk. I'd like to speak to you both. Oh no, Anne whispered to Mars as they walked to the front of the classroom. I'm in trouble with Mrs. Grove again. She must have seen me skipping ahead during reading time. But why you, Mars? You never do nothing. Anything, I never do anything, Mars whispered. That's what I said, you never do nothing. Could you please come up here quietly, Mrs. Grove asked. Anne forced herself to pick up her feet. On either side of Mrs. Grove's desk were two little desks, one for Larry and one for Linda. Nobody said why, but Anne figured it was because nobody wanted them in their group, so the teacher was stuck with them. Oh no, Mars is smiling at them. Now she's even waving at them. She's going to get us in even more trouble, Anne worried. Then Mrs. Grove started talking. On Saturday, I was just sitting down to have my tomato soup and eat my grilled cheese sandwich on a tray in front of the television when I happened to look out my apartment window and guess what I saw? I saw the two of you with your ban the bomb drill sign on the sidewalk right outside my building. What were you girls thinking? Anne stared down at her heavy brown school shoes. She couldn't believe it. It wasn't that Mrs. Grove had seen their sign. They had hoped someone would see it. What Anne really couldn't believe was that Mrs. Grove lived in an apartment, watched television, and ate grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup. It didn't make sense. 
Sometimes Anne's mother let them all eat tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches in front of the television, but only when Anne's father was away on a business trip. And besides, Anne's mother was a mother, not a teacher. Anne knew some mothers went to a job, like Cheryl's mother, who took a bus into work, and Cheryl wore a key around her neck so she could open the door when she got home from school. But Cheryl's mother still cooked dinner just like Anne's mother, except Cheryl's family ate in the kitchen and didn't even have a dining room, and the kids were allowed to talk except Cheryl's dad and brother did most of the talking, and that was all about Westerns and baseball. Anne only knew about mothers. Even on television, there was Lassie's mother. Of course, she wasn't really Lassie's mother. She was the kid's mother. She did stuff like feed the kid and send the kid to school. It was Lassie that protected the kid, like when the cougar was going to jump off the rock and chew the kid to death. Anne started staring at a bug that crawled over the classroom floor near her shoes. She tried to count the bug's legs. Anne would cross her heart and hope to die that Mrs. Grove hadn't told Mars and her about her apartment and tomato soup. But Mars didn't seem to care about this at all. We don't like the bomb drills. They scare us. We don't want them anymore, Mars told Mrs. Grove. Mars is probably looking straight at Mrs. Grove, Anne thought. You've all seen the movie. You know why we need the bomb drills. They are for your own good, to protect you. Anne knew the drills couldn't protect them. She had seen enough movies, movies that were a lot better than the dumb movie Mrs. Grove had shown them in school. And Anne's movies, the atomic bomb made monsters that not even Lassie could save you from, and hiding under a desk wouldn't help. The thing had been in an atomic bomb. So had the giant ants that ate kids like they were sugar. The thing could get you even at the North Pole. And what about the giant birds that flew out of the cracked radioactive eggs to claw kids to death? Anne studied the bugs that was a bug that was now on one of her shoes. It's wrong to waste Kleenex, Mars said. Kleenex? Mrs. Grove sounded really surprised. Yes, you give us Kleenex that we have to hold over our faces during the bomb drill, and then we throw them away. We should use handkerchiefs, Mars said. Anne looked up. Handkerchiefs, she thought? My grandmother has a drawer full of handkerchiefs, but even not even my mother has handkerchiefs. For the first time, Anne felt like Mars was, Mars was like someone from another time. Mrs. Grove looked like she was actually thinking about what Mars had just said, not like it was the craziest thing she had ever heard. You're right, Mars. I never thought about it before. But when I was your age, all of us children had handkerchiefs. No one had Kleenex. But where will you get them? Each child must have one. We will make them out of old material. Anne could tell from Mars' answer that she had done some thinking about this. My mother makes quilts. She has millions of pieces of cloth. She can give us some. Linda was speaking. Anne had hardly ever heard Linda speak in school before and never to the teacher. Now she's going to get it, Anne thought. And so ends part one, which is exactly five minutes long. <laughs> perfect Kathy you, you got the timing down <laughs> to a science and end at a perfect point that was great thank you so much all right and uh, bring your your partner in there David Kepling is going to take over now share the screen and I, I, I've been meaning to ask David you're not any relation to Rudyard are you um, you can tell that story. I, I, have, I have a letter that Rudyard Kipling wrote to my grandfather saying, no, we are not related. <laughs> okay, question answered. <laughs> so, um, this is about things that dwell on your mind. This originally dwelled in France, but now is dwelling here in Canada. On the radio, a cowboy was crooning that he'd done something wrong way, way back in 75 and would the Lord forgive him? Don snorted. 
Don Castro switched stations, reached for his pipe and his tobacco and shifted awkwardly in the lazy boy. Hard to settle some evenings. 1975 for the singer, that would be back when Don had been working for CN Rail. So years ago, some cowboy robbed a liquor store, big deal. The waiting demon in Don's head woke up and dragged him back to CN Rail in Alberta, the line between Edmonton and Swan Landing. They'd been installing new signals. An inch and a half thick, those cables. It had been February, minus 30 out there, and that bastard cable would not cooperate. Not that day. He shifted painfully in the lazy boy. The main cable ran along the south side of the track, so for the signals on the other side, you had to get secondary cables under the rails, through concrete conduits buried in the gravel. Don would walk over, and his apprentice would use a bamboo pole to poke a rope through. The rope was tied to the cable, and Don would pull it all through. That day, Don had pulled most of the signal cable through and shouted, more. That's it, that's all, called the apprentice. Don pulled again, probably frozen mud and crap in the conduit. Don't give me that, he yelled, I need more. He pulled harder with gloved hands and a bad back and another foot of cable scraped out of the conduit. Just enough, just for him to bend the cable up to the steel stanchion to the junction box. He'd wrestle like hell to force it into place. Jesus, in summer, you could bend that supper like toffee. But today, that day, 20 years ago, 20 years, why was he fooling around with it now? There, that was all the cable he was going to get. Don drew his knife blade round the cable and peeled off the plastic. He separated the three wires inside from their fiber packing and stripped their ends down to bare copper. While he squeezed his knife shut, its blade cut into the base of his thumb, and he was glad it was so cold, he didn't even feel it. He began to twist each copper wire round its connector pin. Two loops, two complete loops, it said in the CN manual. Wire one was fine. Wire number two, no problem. And to secure each one, he slipped a washer and a nut over the pin and the wire and screwed them down. But of course, number three connector pin was always mounted about an inch higher up in the box. Muttering a prayer, he used pliers to pull the individual wire further out of the cable sheathing. A centimeter was all he could coax. The bare wire now touched the connector pin, but wasn't long enough to twist round it, not even once. Don glanced at his watch. 4.15, the dark was coming on, the end of the shift, and there was no more fucking cable. Don shut down all thoughts and pressed the washer over the wire and the connector. Stay put, little guy, stay put for Daddy Don. He put on the nut and tightened it extra hard. He didn't dare tug on the wire to check it. He bolted the iron cover back onto the box and stood up to ease his back, trod on the cable where it curved out of the conduit. Jesus Christ, did it give? No, too stiff. It wouldn't have moved, never. Don squinted at the rubber grommet where the cable entered the junction box. It had not shifted. That wire in there would be safe. Don looked across to where the rest of the crew were tossing their tools into the van. Now someone was hooting the horn and flashing their headlights, revealing the first tiny glitters of powder snow beginning to fall. Don knew his stuff. This would be okay. Sure, the CN rule said two complete loops, but as long as the current flowed to the connector, it would work. No point in bringing a whole new cable and redoing a day's work. Don had walked stiffly over to the van, told the guys he'd be skipping the beer parlor this time. In his rental trailer that night, Don awoke from time to time, hearing the westbound freights, grain and ore wagons moaning across the flatlands, 15,000 tons at a time. Later, bad back and too old for minus 30, Don had gone into t electrical sales at Rockwell in Vancouver. There he sold some of the same equipment he'd once installed on the railroad, heavy duty switchgear transformers. He knew that stuff inside out. The sales boss had told customers that Don Castro was a man you could trust. You could bet your life on Don. Now that he was retired, that phrase jumped out at Don some nights when his sciatica would not yield to the whiskey or the pills and his scrappy old bungalow creaked and grumbled at one in the morning. That cowboy singer maybe did do something dumb in his youth, and maybe had a bad moment now and then remembering it, but Don had done nothing wrong, except have an apprentice who couldn't measure a bloody cable. Besides, it was a long time ago. 
Don lit his pipe and waved the match till the flame died and laid it neatly on the ashtray, the burned head inwards. Don was tidy, careful. He closed the tobacco po pouch, smoothing an imperfect stitch in the leather and set the pouch nice and square on the end table. He poked at the silver scar across the base of his thumb, which itched from time to time, like tonight. The end. Beautiful, David. Thank you very much. Thank you for both those stories that you shared with us tonight. That was, that was great. And yeah, just waiting for that connection not to happen. And God knows what that resulted in, right? Oh boy. Yeah. Reminded me of days when I did my own wiring and uh, I, I ran a little short sometimes too, trying to get that last one hooked up. Oh man. Yeah. Fingers crossed all the way. Super. Thank you very much. All right. I got our next uh, reader is Vicki Drybrow coming to us from Port Alberni again. Welcome, Vicki. If you're still with us. Yes, you are. There you are. Oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Please take it away. Thanks, Derek. This is um, a small part of a larger piece, and it's it's written about women who try to be every everything to everybody and what happens it's called the art of falling apart i am sewing a button on my husband's shirt while he shifts his weight from foot to foot and turns to glance at the clock he is going to a meeting i am dressed in an old sweatshirt and jeans my hair hangs in greasy strands because i haven't had time to wash it my new project for work is spread out on the kitchen table, and I have much to do before tomorrow. You know, you used to be a real knockout, he says as I look up at him. It feels as if he has struck me. Comes from living with you for 10 years. I cut the thread and stand up. He doesn't say anything, just grabs his jacket and goes out. His words have taken all the joy out of the work I am doing. I am happy in my job. My life is full of creativity and purpose. Now I feel like a failure, as if I have let myself go. When I was a kid, there was a house where an old couple lived. My mother said, they've let the place go, meaning the garden was overgrown, the gutters were sagging, and the gate was broken. Have I become the human equivalent of that house? I fast all weekend and go on a diet. I eat nothing but a handful of grapes for breakfast, salad with a tiny piece of rubbery chicken for lunch, and a small pile of nauseating steamed vegetables with a few cubes of tofu for dinner. I gain weight. I swim for an hour at six o'clock every morning. I am exhausted by lunchtime. None of my clothes fit. I'm screamingly hungry all the time. I cry a lot and ache all over. There's a safety dinner coming up at my husband's place of work. I find a dress that I absolutely love, but it's a little tight across the bust and hips. They don't have it in a larger size. I buy it anyway, determined to drop the weight before the dinner. It's because you're so bloody little, says my friend who towers over me at five foot 10. Every ounce counts. After work, I drive to the mall and buy a ridiculously expensive pair of designer stilettos. A few days later, I burst into tears at a staff meeting and run from the room. I am mortified and filled with fear of winding up in the psych ward. Two of my older colleagues recommend going to Weight Watchers. That takes forever. I have to lose five pounds in two weeks. You're not doing yourself any favors, says Shirley, who I know used to be heavy. Your body's gone into starvation mode. That's why you're not losing any weight. So what do I do? They tell me to eat three sensible meals a day and keep exercising. Small portions, says Helen. Was she implying that I eat like a logger? Has she seen what I've been eating? Three grapes for breakfast 
Who the hell does that? I dream every night of peanut butter on white bread and bacon and eggs. Eat a piece of fruit in the middle of the afternoon so you don't pig out at dinner. Anything, I'll do anything to feel worthy of my husband's love. I want him to be proud of me. Long story short, I get my hair cut and colored and return home with a bag full of makeup that costs more than I've spent on food for the last month. I lose a few pounds and wear the dress, which is still too tight and makes me look as if I've gained weight. When I meet my husband's new boss, he asks me when I am due. I retreat to the bathroom where I cry huge, snotty tears until mascara drips off my chin. Feeling like a complete failure, I return to the banquet room where I eat too much rich food and wash it down with copious amounts of wine. Then, while my husband and his production team are accepting an award, I am kneeling in front of a toilet, throwing it all up. Behind the self-loathing and the humiliation, is a new and tantalizing thought that at least I won't gain any weight today. Thank you, Vicki. That was, that was gritty <laughs> and probably too real for, for too many people. I uh, appreciate that. And for those of you who don't know, Vicki is a uh, co-author with me on uh, both sides now and with Libby Morin as well, our latest collection of short stories there. So, uh, which I think we're going to do another launch one of these days, if COVID ever enters, ends and uh, do one in the flesh. But uh, that's the way it is right now. So our next reader is Joy. And just before we bring Joy on, I just want to remind people that um, if you're feeling generous tonight, that e-transfer at charslanding.com will always accept your e-transfer. And uh, Char will greatly appreciate it, as will all of us, uh, to, to see Char keeping the, the place heated and alive until we can get back there together and, and share some face-to-face -face time. So our next reader is Joy Sheldon, coming to us from the Cowichan Valley. Hi. 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 Um, mine was a longer piece, but I edited it down to exactly five minutes, and I timed it. And yeah. uh, I was going to do a reading from uh, Couch and Kid, my recently published memoir, a humor reading. And I joined the arts group called the Omniform Lounge, which I put a little note in the chat about. And um, we talked a bit about writing inspiration, what brings on the muse and what you can do when you haven't got one. And I had written a somewhat related piece about five years ago when I was still a GRG, and that stands for Grandparent Raising Grandchildren. So without further ado, here is writing the obsession that never quits. When the muse calls, one must answer. Writing sucks. It's an obsession, a torment, an all-encompassing passion, especially for senior writers like me. Wish I'd felt this way about my ex-husbands. It prevents you going to the bathroom or you end up writing notes in the bathroom. Relationships are ignored, even the girlfriends, ouch. You feel guilty if you coffee clatch with the seniors at the local cafe because you're not writing in the ever-present notebook welded to your right hip. Even more of a challenge if you're a GRG writer. Your house looks like a bomb hit it. To the grandkid, I don't know where your sock is. Go barefoot. You can't find anything, especially your glasses. You even search under the bed covers. What's that moldy apple core doing in the foot of my bed? Meals get skipped and then you pig out after. Your house, your computer desk, the floor beside your bed, the dashboard of your vehicle, are all festooned with sticky notes and worse. You write on the backs of old grocery receipts, unprinted edges of newspapers, and the backs of papers already printed on. When really desperate, you resort to writing on your hand. Remember years ago when people even wrote between the lines of letters received? I haven't resorted to that yet, but maybe one day. And then the rushed up handwriting, often Ill illegible, a messy combo of printing and script. Lecture note scrawl, we called it back in the stone ages when I attended university. 
It really sucks when you've written a whole page and can only decipher about half of it. Transcribing into the computer, you often end up writing something you didn't intend to write at all. Writing is not just a calling, it's a screaming. This little voice hammering in my head. When it gets so loud that I can't stand it, I have to go and write to turn it off. Maybe I'll even get to do a chore or visit a friend in the meantime. But then the words again, building and building until it becomes a tsunami, a tsunami in my head that I can only stop by putting pen to paper. The thoughts flow out of my brain and right through my fingers. On the other hand, it's better than a lover because you're in control. Any mistakes that are made will be yours. You don't have to please anybody else, just yourself, unless you're writing to the market. I don't think I'll ever be able to write to market. I've got to write what I've got to write. If anybody else wants to read it, bonus. If not, say la vie. I have an alter ego. There's me and there is the writer me. When I read great humor writers like Jack Knox of the TC, I wonder how does he come up with all this funny stuff day after day? How does he keep it fresh? Then I hear this little voice in my head answering. He just goes into writer mode. When I begin to write, I have no, often have no idea what I'm going to say, as is happening now. But it has to be said. That little voice will nagle me incessantly till I give in to it like that slice of ice trudel in the deli case. I then hear my altar voice, not the voice I use greeting people on the street, not the voice that speaks the usual thoughts in my head, but my writer's voice. I have never met Jack Knox, but I suspect that he doesn't speak exactly as he writes, nor do I. My writing voice is stronger and usually more put together than my street voice. It is neither my greeting the neighbors during my nightly constitutional, nor my arguing with the grandkids voice. These words have subtle differences, but differences nevertheless. I have now published four books at Amazon Books and I'm working on a fifth. Friends often ask me, how do you come up with all these ideas? I don't, my little voice does. I've attended a few writers conferences. Sounds to me like this publishing game is pretty much of a losing proposition. You have about as much chance of getting published by a traditional publisher as getting a free belly tuck. Only 10% of manuscripts ever get published. That statistic is almost as bad as your chances with Lotto BC. I almost laugh at some of the conference titles. How to keep your muse going. What to do when you're blocked. I sure don't have that problem. I guess that's why I don't write much fiction, except for my two children's books. All I have to do is comment on the lunacy that is my life or all around me. Like the three or four sentences written, then a little voice, Granny, I can't find clean panties, or an older kid, sick with a virus, horking into the toilet, and I've got to run. Literally, got to run. Thank you very much, Joy. Yeah, beautiful. Good to hear some of that again. It's been a couple of years since the Writers' Conference. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on then to uh, local Port Alberni writer Bruce Hornage now. Bruce, are you there? Derek? Uh-huh. You forgot Jackie. Oh, my goodness. Jackie's number seven. She's before number eight. Thank God I know her well enough to not be too embarrassed about this. Sorry, Jackie, I skipped right over you to Bruce there. I saw the J and thought, oh, that's Joy. I'm already done, Joy. Seniors moment. No worries. All right. So I'm a... reading from uh, Heard Amid the Guns, True Stories from the Western Front, 1914 to 1918 by me. Uh, Heritage House, it's one of those launchless launchers, November. Uh, Okay, and this book is full of little tiny stories um, related to World War I, and uh, there's a whole section about animals. So I'm reading One Tough Pigeon. 
Automotive inventions changed warfare in obvious ways, while horse and mule power was still used for hauling everything from big guns to food supplies at the front, truck and tank capabilities made mobilization convenient in new ways. <clears throat> Take the inventive motorized portable dovecote, basically a motorhome for carrier pigeons. Cher Ami, French for dear friend, was one of 600 pigeons trained for the U.S. Army Signal Corps in France. And when Charles Whitt Whittlesey and the Lost Battalion, the 77th Infantry Division, became trapped in wooded pocket in the Argonne behind enemy lines without food or ammunition, dwindling and sure to perish, pigeons bearing the messages, many wounded, we cannot evacuate, and men are suffering, can support be sent? were sent out and shot down. One last pigeon, the famed Cherami, a bird of great valor, was given the desperate marriage message to carry. Our artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop. Whittlesey, Major 308. Cherami was wounded by shrapnel, shot through the breast, blinded in one eye, but she survived to wing 45 kilometers to the rear in just 26 minutes. That critical delivery saved the 194 surviving men. Medics scrambled to save her. The French honored her with the Croix de Guerre with palm and oak leaf cluster. And when she left France for a well-deserved rest, US General John J. Pershing saw her off. Upon her 1919 death from wounds suffered in battle, the lauded Cherami was stuffed, her final loft, the Smithsonian Museum. She has her own books. She is depicted as a character in the 2001 movie, The Lost Battalion, directed by Russell Mulcahy and starring Rick Schroeder. Cherami was inducted into the Racing Pigeon Hall of Fame in 1931 and honored with a gold medal from the organized bodies of American racing pigeon fanciers. Her handler in the Signal Corps, Enoch Clifford Swain, was honored for his work. And in November 1919, Cherami was in a small covey of eight animals, some living, some dead, to be honored on Capitol Hill by Angels Without Wings and the National Marine Corps League with the Animals in War and Peace Medal of Bravery, a congressional medal created by author Robin Hutton for outstanding American animals in both war and peace. Wow, amazing, amazing bird, eh? Wow, to go through that. Unreal. And to get all those accolades in the end. Sweet. So, super. Thank you for, uh, uh, you know, dealing with my gaff there and, <laughs> and reading so well. Onward and on to uh, Bruce Hornage now. Bruce, are you handy there? Yep, yep. So Fort Alberni writer, welcome again, Bruce. Yep. The screen is all yours, my friend. Yeah, the book I'm writing on logging is per se finished, so uh, we're, we're still working on uh, prettying that up a bit or uh, making some major changes. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> the chapter on conflict with bosses in Kennedy Lake Division. After writing the rough draft for this chapter about conflicts I had with bosses, I pondered how could I have become such a problem that they were compelled to assault my livelihood and personal safety. Every one of them, save Big Ugly, whom everyone respected, threatened me over the life of my career. I was hugely concerned about doing the best spelling job possible. As the faller safety representative, I encouraged other fallers to use only safe procedures in their job and not to become lazy or take shortcuts. I encouraged best consideration for the environment and the best quality of log salvage and best bucking for the efficient moving of logs to the haul roadways. If that requires workplace suppression for doing the right thing with the resource, then the system of quantity of trees felled and butchery is sick. Personal safety is the faller's concern and not to be interfered with by a pushy foreman. I wrote letters of concern to newspapers, the Union, Ministry of Forests and Fisheries, 
and politicians about the correct use of the resource. I got some acknowledgments, but never saw any actions on the issues I raised. All of them were written in my best handwriting for legibility. And later I realized handwritten letters are easily tossed in the garbage. Printed copy is preferred reading. No one likes to have negative feedback about your job anyway. I could see that if no improvement in our logging methods showed a, a respect for the environment, then some people with power would force the changes needed. My guiding mantra was do the safest job possible. It was well learned from very excellent training and experience. Do the best value production for efficient log movement from the forest. Production volume comes from the ease of falling terrain and tree size. The foreman knew this and knew better than to threaten me. I was shocked by the abuse. I reacted with absolute violent verbiage to the point of shaking to my core. No further action was ever taken against me and each foreman was removed from the division. I survived at a dangerous job. I am saddled with a distrustful anger at anyone who holds a misuse of power over me or anyone else for selfish reasons. If these bosses were pressed by superiors, then somewhere up the chain of command are more abusers in the system. And I guess there will always be people to root them out. Into the 21st century, abuse from people with power over others became a buzzword for court cases for sexual abuse. Try that in the logging industry and you could get your face smashed in or worse. I never heard of any sexual advances in the bush. Anyway, being abused by a boss leaves you with choices. Ignore it and tell the guy to go ahead and carry out his threat. <clears throat> Knuckle under to the threat. Do as you're told, perhaps till you get hurt or start swinging. As for me, I verbally exploded and told everyone about the problem. But I am sure each foreman thought I was going to damage them. I have trust issues and am suspicious of, of the motives of people. I will live with those effects, and I'm always leery that perhaps even I'm a whiner. Anyway, I thought that would set off that particular chapter just to discuss uh, problems I had with uh, bosses. But anyway, it's a. Uh, <laughs> I know. Hopefully, I never blow up at anybody. Least of all, uh, Jackie. <laughs> 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 well, so far you've been pretty civil with us there, Bruce. I don't know. <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, what you were talking about, it sounds like you were pretty justified in what you were doing. And and uh, especially, you know, issues around your own safety. Hey, you know, yeah. Yeah. if we don't stand up for ourselves, uh, who will? And especially in those days, I know safety was not a huge concern of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the foremen and a lot of the, the companies, right? So, yeah. so it's probably a testament to why you're still alive today. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> there's, a, there's a healthy use of anger when it comes down to it, right? <laughs> so, more power to you. Yep. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for sharing that, Bruce. Appreciate it. And uh, Carl, was that everybody for tonight? I just want to make sure I didn't. Yes, that is everybody for tonight. And I'm sorry for the stuff in the chat. I was my mistake. Names wise, sorry. Oh, oh yeah, no worries, no worries. All good, all good. Okay, well then I guess we got a few thank yous to say here before we wind up and um, just want to uh, begin by thanking everybody who, who came on here and who read for us tonight, especially our featured readers, uh, Francine and Michelle, those were awesome, awesome. And uh, all the other uh, people on Luma's list who shared their work, uh, most enjoyable. Uh, big thank you, of course, to Char and Char's Landing for being our Zoom host. <laughs> there she is. And to Carl, our moderator, who kept me on track, and Jackie, our artistic director, who lined things up and was gracious about being bumped. <laughs> and um, who else do I need to thank? Am I missing anybody? No, just uh, I'd like to thank Derek. Our listener. Yeah, thank you, Derek. And oh, thank you, Derek. Uh, yeah. I, I had a long day of tutoring, so I'm kind of slap happy by this point. But um, thank you to our listeners who, who came on and just, uh, just lent an ear. And uh, if you're a closet writer there, maybe next month you'll think about joining us and bringing some of your writing along. We'd love to hear it. You know, we're, we're uh, open to everybody. Uh, good to have you with us, Jim Wright, and um, glad you're in Port Alberni, man. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Hey, Ardell. Thank, thank you, you Michelle. Thank you, Ardell. Thank you, everybody. What, Derek, what are the rules? Uh, it's just, uh, if you want to sign up, you just got to get a hold of uh, Carl, you better give the, the address there. <laughs> I'll, type it I'll type it in. Thank you, sir. Jack okay. E. We'll type it in the chat. Okay. <laughs> and it's just a you know, five minute time limit on the people on Luma's list. That's uh, that's it. And it's it's poetry, creative nonfiction, fiction. As long no as hate speech. No hate speech, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's all good. And um, yeah, so uh, please join us, Ardell. And, and if you've got something to share, we'd love to hear yes. it. And as you notice, I put in the, uh, there, Paul Bernie does have a new bookstore. It's all new books. We actually, one of our authors that's been on here before has his book there, The Vikings, is actually in Port You can buy it now locally in Port Alberni. Ah. So you don't have to go to Amazon.com anymore. You can go right to Do you, do you mean Bernie. Bill Arnett? Do you mean Bill Arnett? With yes, Don, his, yes Don Bill Arnett's Don books Viking. in there. John Viking. Mm -hmm. John Viking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So right. there. So I put the website in there. So if anybody wants to get a book somewhere else, there you go. Perfect. You have to have the date of next month's meeting. Uh, it is oh, the Friday, the third Friday. The third Friday, Friday of the month. month. Yeah. And also just a reminder that that uh, Kamal uh, uh, Parmar is going to have her reading on Sunday, the 25th at two o'clock in the afternoon. If you go to sharslanding.com, there's a, a link for that that you can get uh, zoom in, right, Char? Yeah, thanks, Derek. Yeah, Electric Mermaid. We've got the live reads tonight, the third uh, Friday of each month. And then we've got our special features. So if anyone has a book coming up and if anyone would like to do a workshop or have their own um, book announced, we'd be thrilled to highlight you. So yeah, we're doing, um, Derek is going to host us and Carl's going to moderate. Jacqueline is doing the um, artistic directing of uh we're really thrilled to be able to expand our open mic our spoken word open mic um to include so many of you talented writers so please uh join us uh april 25th with kamal and then carl what's the date for the 21st of may may 21st the third friday of may so we look forward to seeing you all then thank yes. you yes thanks sure do you think and, uh, any of your group would be interested in the Omniform Lounge information? It's yeah, put, it in the, put it in the chat. Right there. Oh, I'll put it in the chat. Sure. Right, yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, yeah, I know that's coming out of Nanaimo. And, yeah, the and thing is, you can, you can post it on uh, the Facebook page. That's another thing. Just wanted to remind people to follow us on Facebook. Yes. And, uh, and you can, you know, look for play things to post there, especially things that involve our regulars. We're so happy and we'd like to invite everybody to become a regular wherever you live. This is a national opportunity. Actually, it's international. We have Americans reading here too. So we really welcome uh, people from all over to make this your, your, um, your writing, your literary home. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you both are all ready to say thank you to Michelle Butler Hallett and to friends. Yes, and thank, thank you, Michelle, and for being Michelle. our teachers tonight. And Francis, especially Michelle, for staying up really late. Thank it's Pat's so midnight much. there. Yeah, uh, it's heartwarming and tear jerking, and <laughs> like it really um, hit home for many of us. So thank you both for your your events. All right. We'll uh, kind of hang around here. If anybody wants to stay in chat, we'll stay unmuted. And but we'll and, let uh, you go, Michelle. Yeah, <laughs> get <you>. some sleep. <laughs> you learned uh, in your bed tonight, Michelle. It's so nice sure. to have David joining us too, all the way from St. John's. So that's pretty wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Francine, thank you so much. Stay safe in Saskatoon, Francine. Stay safe. Yes, Francine. Yeah, you're welcome. Miigwech. Miigwech. Good night. Good night. Good night. Awesome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care. Oh. Could I ask a quick question? Yes, sure. you can. I, I do get up and move around quite a bit. I have a long steel rod in my back and I suffer badly from back pain. I can't sit for long periods. Do you guys see me doing that? Like, does it, will it disrupt you? You can um, always, if you feel um, like, like for me, when I get up and leave, yeah. when I get up and leave, I actually stop my video and I just like I just, like I just did. There's a yeah. picture of me 
when Michelle was, I didn't want to yawn when Michelle was on. I thought it's late there. I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna just lock my video so she didn't see me doing that. How do I how do I lock my video? Should I ask the girl? Says, say stop again. So when it says stop video, lower left hand corner. Oh, okay. I, yeah. So let's click. just you press that. There you go. Yeah. You're locked. You're gone. And then you and then you just press it. Brilliant. And I then it says something. start video. Then you yeah you got her. I learned something new. Thanks a lot. I just didn't want to be distracting because I can only sit for like 15, 20 minutes and I gotta move. No, yeah. we understand. We're all getting that way. Even some of us that don't have that in our backs, we just get antsy. <laughs> <laughs> our bums get sore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was reminiscent of the uh, poem about the uh, the Cree fellow that, uh, what was he, a, a little imp or something that he took a bite out of his own butt. I thought that oh, was great. The trickster. That was a wonderful <laughs> line to end yeah. the poem. <laughs> yeah. You didn't use and the word. Derek, book. maybe yeah. you could put on, it, where you guys can get your books too, that you, uh, you and uh, Libby and all those people have. So we can maybe yeah. put that on our, our Facebook page too, so we can get that. For sure, yeah, just rcnmedia.com. But right. uh, yeah, I can I can post that on there, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we'll do for sure, yeah. So uh, Kathy and David, I, I'm uh, I'm waiting for when your book's coming out, you guys. Uh, oh, please. They yeah. need Kathy. to do a book, Kathleen and Kathy. David. Yeah. Yes. We want a book. We want a book. Hey, did you guys submit something? I haven't gone through the entries yet, but did you submit something for the anthology? Well, that was the one. I, I felt dishonest about it, like it was supposed to have something at Port Alberni. Yeah, so you have to change it. To, you have to change something in it to be Port Alberni. That's all you have to do. I felt like I should move or something. <laughs> you should. We'd like to have you. You come this way. Okay, but in the meantime, yeah. <laughs> That's just good. change one word. That's all you have to do. Whatever it was, just change one word to Port Alberni. You know. Put yeah. in Shars Landing. Shars Landing. Yeah, you can just put Shars Landing in there. You know, as a writer, you know how easy it is to just transform the setting by changing the name of the town that it's close to or whatever. <laughs> you can do it. Anyway, we, we would love to have a piece of, of your writing to go in there for both of you. So if, if you... Uh, I, I know it's a little past the deadline, but I think we could make an exception here because uh, your your reticence. You're amazing. Is, you know, you're amazing. You belong in the anthology. You belong here in Port Alberni. Yeah. So, where, where does that go anyway? You, I can't. Oh no! Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the the anthology is going to be distributed mostly in the valley, but you know because. Where would we send something to? Send it to Derek. Oh, Derek, put just, your email yeah. there, please. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat here. Just email it to me. Let's just get the, everybody up here. Everyone, there we go. Joy, that's a thought for you too. Yeah. Just have to have to have something in it about Port Alberni. Have to about the Alberni that. Valley. Just just change from the Cowichan Valley to the Alberni Valley, and there it's all go. good. There yeah. you go. All right. Sure. Hanbury at hotmail.com. We'll uh, now I have to do this file. No, no, that's no go for the dots. I think, yeah, that's right. Just where it says file right by side of the dots. There three you dots. Chat. There you Thanks, go. Chat. You yeah. got it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So, I mean, who in Zoom figured out that always oh, just go for the dots, forget the words, <laughs> just go for the three dots. That's right, uh, uh, Kathleen yeah. and David. You are family, you're a club char family now. Yes. So, yeah, you thumbs up anything you need. We're, we're there yes. for you. And if you didn't know, uh, we you can sign up for it if you want a 10 minute. We only have one slot, we already have May spoken for. But if you want to sign up for June or July, uh, uh, you can, one of you or I enjoy too, either one of you guys. Joy, yeah, Joy, you were looking for some more time. So you just. Yeah, so there you go. It's one, yeah. one time a month. Each month we have one spot for oh, 10 minutes. That works. I didn't know that. But at any rate, I got part two. <laughs> I didn't read tonight was part two. Ah, oh, see, see, that's what for, for our regulars. It's a special place on Luma's list for our regulars. It's called um, Member, Member Spotlight, right? Am I right, Jacqueline? Spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. So, Joy, that's a way to get a special section for like 10 minutes there. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll sign up for that. 
Okay, so and, and then I'll do two different things so it won't be too boring. Might be, well, hopefully I'm never boring, but going on for 10 minutes might be a bit much, but I'll do two two five minute jobbies. Yeah, it's it's a good time for something separate special. Pieces of writing. It's a good time yeah. for something yeah. special and it's we only have one each month. So you have to sign up with Carl and you yeah. know how to reach him. You just uh, uh, do the electric mermaid reads. So, so I already have May, I, so we have June, July and August and I think forth. Carl, you've got Kathy and da and or David for the next. Where are we? May, and then Joy for June, right? I got May. Actually, I got Mickey for May. Yeah. Okay, then Kat Kathy, Kathleen, and David for June, and then Joy for I July. Joy. No, you, there's right? only one. There's only one. They're each gonna if they each want to sign up. Then they each there. get a one. They each get. Then they yeah. then they have to sign up for like July. Oh, yeah and August. Yeah, just one a month. One a month. <laughs> Wait, I'll, just, straight. I'll just take whatever I can get. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just let me know when, if you want, whenever you want, let me know and yeah. I'll and let me in know there. when you can, that'd be great, thanks. Just, yeah, just email me and I'll let you know. It's a real challenge, you know, working with the five minute thing and, and oh, what yeah. I realized when I I uh, I went to a, a reading and I was invited to be like one of six readers at this special thing that they don't have anymore because this restaurant in Vancouver closed. But, um, and it was like seven minutes. And I was told in advance that if you go over, you never will be invited back. <laughs> oh, oh no, so that's like, scary. And, but I did the wrong thing. I, I took my piece and I cut it and cut it and cut it on the ferry, on the ferry ride over. I cut all the extra words out of it that I could. I'm like, I'm gonna be Hemingway. It goes, it goes, it goes. I'm slashing and burning. And then when I got there and I timed it with my friend on the ferry and we're like, okay, let's read it. I like, oh, no, I need to slice off another 22 seconds. But when I got there, in order to be sure that I could get invited back, I sped through my material and I'm, a, I'm pretty fast. Like I read it, I can do it, right? But what I didn't realize is when you read too fast, yeah, it spoils stuff it. goes over people's head. The humor, they miss it. The suspense, it's gone. And so now when I'm given a time, like, okay, you have three minutes. I don't try and do the whole thing. I pick the most suspense, the thing that ends at the most suspenseful part. I want to get them to be like, oh, I want to read more of her stuff. Yeah. And so I time it with all the timing that allows for the pauses, and then I cut it off. Instead of trying to get through the whole thing, yeah. I now cut it off at a place where I feel like they're gonna say, wow. I you wanna, wanna buy that book. Yeah, I wanna buy that book. So I don't know if that experience helps anybody, but that's what I do, so. Yeah, it makes sense, Jackie, and I'm sure it would be a lot less stressful to do it that way, where you know you've got a little buffer of time and you can just really relax and just read it at the pace you'd like to to read it at, really. And, it, and you will be invited back. You're always invited back. We don't do what the other one will do. We will not say you're not invited. You are always <laughs> welcome. And we've got some. We've got someone who's who's walking us through his fantasy. It's been a while since he's uh, been with us, Rory, but he does a beautiful job of that. Like. This is how much I've got of the story. And by the next time, the regulars are all saying, what's next? We want to yeah, hear it. Yeah, yeah. Give us the next okay. installment. Serialize your work. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah. what we'll do is, okay, so I'll just tell you now, May, June, we'll give Kathy June. She'll get, she gets 10 minutes in June. Kathy, you get 10 minutes in June. <laughs> and David gets July. And <laughs> David gets July. July. And then we'll get uh, Joy in July. In August will be July Joy. You know, I'll get 10 minutes in August. Great. <laughs> Pray to God I'm still alive by then. <laughs> and you can still come. You br still bring your five minutes every other time, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not the regular, right. but you I should, say, I should say about Pat Buckner, because we wouldn't have heard about it if it hadn't been for him. Isn't Pat uh -huh. wonderful? It's been too long since I've heard him read. He's fabulous. Yes. I hope he comes yeah. back soon. He's just yes. And thank you to Pat. He was the one that noticed the date was wrong because it was actually he. It was his birthday on the Thursday, so he realized <laughs> that that was like oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But he, I had the bug out newsletter. That's how we knew about. It. I mean, you were in his newsletter, and uh -huh. then he, he oh. Was, at the Gibson's open mic, he told us all about it too. And so, 
personally said, these people are so nice and they really don't, you know, they would be welcoming. Kathleen, do you want Shars Landing um, monthly email? Would you like that? Yeah. Okay. Add it to our email distribution list. Oh, yes. We should ask, uh, we should ask every time. Uh, Derek, mm -hmm. just email to Electric Mermaid and say, I'd like to be added to the list. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah, yeah we'll do yes. that. Yes. Thank you, Shar, yeah. for that. Yeah, because we're lucky Pat Buckner is really connected with it. Yes. He, he gets it. Good, big but shout Carl, out to Pat. Carl, if you want our regular, yeah, Carl, will get you on there. Yeah. We'll get you, that's right. right. We'll get you on there. Yeah. I have a question about Charles, Charles Landing. Um, is it a hotel and is it going to be awesome. open for business over the summer? What is Charles Landing? Char? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, since you asked, Shars, is, it was built in Port Alberni, was built as a, uh, as a church in, in 1912, August 4th, 1912, was the first church service, and it was, um, uh, I lost it now, but it'll come to me, but, um, but yes, and then I bought in 2010 and converted it to my home, and plus I have a hostel downstairs, but uh, I celebrate upstairs here in the hall um, is a community meeting space. So that's kind of my thing. Uh, wh where's your home, Joy? Ladysmith. Ladysmith, yeah. So, I mean, Ryan McMahon is one of your musicians, and he's played here 23 times with his oh. band. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's an amazing one guy. Of the our favorites. He actually put my name on one of his CDs, like actually acknowledged me, which was a big deal. You know Ryan McMahon, right? If you like live music. No, no, but no. Oh, live music, but, uh, uh, ladies. He's an amazing Google, guy. Google him. Yeah, Google him. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I've been the very proud home of um, our spoken word open mic, our local group. That and Derek was one of the original uh, founders of our group. It was called uh, Bernie Valley Words on Fire. And uh, well before 2010, but I've been hosting since 2010 here mm -hmm. at Shars. And, and, <laughs> uh, and yeah, yeah. And so um, I would say, uh, Jacqueline, you came here in, I'd say, 2019, 2018. Nope. You started coming and bringing your workshops here. Was that about the right date, 2018, 2019? Uh, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and then, of course. But geez, 20, you've been coming way before with, that, though. You've been coming for a long time. Yeah, well, Jacqueline, when she was Federation of BC Writers, she started bringing the workshops here. And, uh, and we've continued to do our spoken word open mic with our sorry i just turned out the light but uh yeah and so now 2020 we've been hosting zoom sessions so yeah does that answer your question joy great thing. yes and um yes it's a disappointment to a lot of us i was a regular performer at the um open mic here in ladysmith at the uh, united church hall and we did right. a combination we were allowed to do three things and try to keep it to around 10 minutes so yeah. I would usually do two songs and one reading. I sing and play drums. Yeah, so, you so it's really sad minutes. that we can't. Yeah. And I can't well, figure a good way to play my drum in front of my computer. Yeah, we've always only That's just done about. five minutes. Like uh, Derek was one of the original founders, and that was their formula was five minutes. I remember. We, can't, we, can, we just, uh, unfortunately, if, if, we, if we had 10 minutes apiece, we'd be here till midnight. And yeah. for Friends in, in St. John's, that would be particularly difficult, so. <laughs> or anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, or anywhere else. Yeah, anywhere Or even else. as locals that can stay yeah, up that late. People have got a limit that they can spend with Zoom, so we have to look for, you That's know, right. other ways to do longer format things. Yeah. I, want, I wanted to say something about Electric Mermaid, and I, you know, I won't ask the question about how it got to be electric, but it reminded me that this week in a local Facebook page, um, there was a plea for help. And I answered by saying, you've given me the inspiration for a story. Uh, somebody posted this, I'm looking for an electrician for my elderly mother. <laughs> oh, I love it. 
<laughs> you thought a mermaid might swim over. I, I there we go. We can send the mermaid over to help you. Like I, I love those those ads that are that were getting butchered. Like I, I had my favorite one of all time. I think was someone put an ad in the pets section, uh, and they they said um, for sale three German Shepherd puppies. We'll consider selling mother also. And mother was capitalized. <laughs> I considered selling my mother. I just wasn't sure there was a market for her. So, yeah, we'll consider selling mother also. <laughs> I hope it was the mother dog, not the actual mother. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the wife of the... <laughs> well, oh, I have to go. Speaking of dogs, I have to go walk mine. It's lovely to see you all again. And we'll see you yes. next time. Bye, yes. Bye everybody. Bye. Good night, thank you, all. Derek. Awesome hosting, Derek. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. It's all great fun. Great job, man. Derek. Yeah, great job. Thank Another you. wonderful night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah. See you all on uh, Sunday the 25th. Yeah. yeah.